Hello, bonjour, and happy Thanksgiving, y'all. My name is KJ, and whether you celebrated this past week or not, I hope that your heart has been full of gratitude to God, the fountain and source of every good thing this past week. That's what Thanksgiving is really all about. Anyway, if you have a Bible handy, please take it and find Paul's letter to Titus. We are wrapping up our series in the book of Titus today. After nine weeks, we've arrived together at the end of chapter three and at the end of the book of Titus. From the beginning, our theme for this series has been set in order what remains. That was Paul's reason for sending Titus among the newly planted churches on the island of Crete. He told him in chapter 1, verse 5, set in order what remains. When we, as a new church, began this journey through the book of Titus, this was our goal as well. Set in order what remains. As we approach the journey's end now, I'm very happy to say that we've taken a huge step forward as a church. We now have three new elders, Ed, Scott, and Paul, joining Parker and myself in the task of leading and shepherding the church family at EIC Turn. We've done what the Apostle Paul called Titus to do in raising up a plurality of elders from within the church. Every church ought to grow to the point of having a plurality of leaders because, after all, there is wisdom in an abundance of counselors and there is safety when there is accountability in decision making. Please do thank God with us for such a unified affirmation from the church membership in the elder selection process. It really was a, a joy to see. And please pray for these men as we meet together as an elder team for the very first time on Sunday evening. We need your prayers as we tackle big things like the church budget and how we respond to the changing pandemic situation and COVID rules in France. As you probably know, there are some special exemptions being given to churches as of this Sunday. Uh, I'm so, so very thankful that we have a group of elders now to help navigate the changing rules and chart a wise course forward for the church. I will let you know as soon as possible if the elders make decisions that change what we're doing as a church in response to the coronavirus crisis that we find ourselves in. But for right now, let's just thank God. Let's thank God as we continue to set in order what remains and conclude our journey through the book of Titus. Let me read for us Titus chapter 3 verse 8 to the end of the book. Uh, and then pray for us as we jump into God's word. This is Titus chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want to speak to you confidently. I'm sorry, I want you to speak confidently. So that those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies, and strife, and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Uh, would you pray with me? Father, I ask that as we dive now into this final section of the book of Titus, that your word might be rich and it might richly dwell in us, Lord. Uh, show us truth. Uh, let us hold it confidently. Uh, let us hold it bravely. Let us um, uh, know that you are with us, that you love us, 
that you are guiding us by your spirit into your truth. And Lord, may you open our eyes now to see wonderful things in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. We live in a world today that is full of fake news. In one sense, fake news is nothing new at all. Ever since the serpent whispered, you shall surely not die, but be like God, there has been fake news in the world. What's different today is the platform through which most of us often encounter it. It's a platform where anyone can write anything and it's monetized where more clicks mean more money. In, in what should amount to a rejection of postmodernism on a global scale, the internet is full of people making truth claims, many of them sweeping absolute truth claims. This product will make your face look a decade younger. This political policy has all the science, not just science, but all the science on its side. This public figure was overheard saying this ridiculous thing by this anonymous source. This particular issue, if you don't care about it to the extent that I do, then you might as well grow a tiny mustache and call yourself Hitler. <laughs> The internet is full of people making truth claims, often very absolute ones. How are we to evaluate those claims? How are we to evaluate truth claims without living completely different lives than we do now? Like we are all now professional fact checkers who Facebook and Twitter ought to consider employing for all the good we do the world. Without making a vocation, out of fact checking, here is what we all can do. When we encounter a truth claim, we can ask ourselves, what does this truth claim produce? What does it produce? Nine times out of 10, fake claims at truth are meant to produce outrage and anger in us. If it's sold as a news story, uh, if it's a product, nine times out of 10, fake claims at truth are meant to produce desire and dissatisfaction. It's probably higher than nine times out of 10 because news that produces outrage sells. It gets the clicks, it gets the shares. Products that produce a must-have dissatisfaction make people reach for their wallets. When a truth claim is made, ask yourself, what does it produce? Outrage and anger? desire and dissatisfaction, or does it produce confident hearts careful to engage in good deeds? So very different things, aren't they? The truth claims that we encounter in Titus chapter three are unlike most of those we encounter today on the internet. These truth claims push us toward good deeds. These truths produce hearts filled with love instead of outrage and hate. These truths produce a joyful contentment in God instead of dissatisfaction with our lot in the world. And unlike what you read on the internet, these truth claims are ones we can trust and speak confidently about. Verse 8 says, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. Here we have truth that you can trust. These statements about Jesus, these statements about life and death, about ultimate things are trustworthy statements. They are truths that people like Paul willingly and gladly gave his life for. They are truths for which the apostles and much of the early church chose to embrace death rather than renounce and relinquish them. The gospel is trustworthy to an extent that you can bet your life on it being true. I hope you wouldn't say the same 
about that article sent to you by a Facebook friend of your grandparents? Would you? I hope you wouldn't. You wouldn't bet your life on that being true. And even if it is true, I'll guarantee you that it won't produce the good in your life that the gospel will. Verse 8 says, This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. The gospel is good news that you can trust and speak confidently about. Why? Because more than any other ideology imaginable, the gospel produces people who are careful to engage in good deeds. Other sets of ideas also have other products. They produce things. The Russian Bolsheviks came proclaiming an ideology of overturning the hierarchies in society in favor of the working man. But what did it produce? It produced a lot of bloodshed and a new hierarchy dispensing its own kind of misery to people. Jesus came proclaiming something else. Jesus came proclaiming peace, peace between God and man, a peace purchased by his shed blood, and a hierarchy of God's kingdom which, in which the humblest believer becomes part of heaven's royal family. The product of this ideology, this is of this good news, ought to be peace on earth, goodwill to men, right? This is what the gospel proclaims, peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's what the gospel rightly understood, truly believed, should produce in us. Why is that? Because there is a direct link between what we believe and what we do. Look again at verse 8. Paul says, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed, have believed God, will be careful to engage in good deeds. Contrary to what some might think, our hands do not have minds of their own. <laughs> our hands act out of the overflow of what our hearts believe. That's why our actions often reveal the remaining points of unbelief that are still in us, still in our hearts. Our actions show what aspects of the gospel haven't quite clicked with us yet. We haven't quite got it yet. Our heads may know that we should forgive just as we've been forgiven, but our unbelieving hearts act like that's not true. They act like it's not true when they hold when we hold on to grudges against others, when we refuse to forgive. We won't have the power and motivation to act like we should in this world until our hearts believe what they should about the world to come. It's like our actions are the propellers, propellers of a plane frantically spinning, but our hearts and what our hearts believe are the engines powering it. I'm gonna, the hearts are the engines and what they believe are the fuel powering our actions. We do what we are motivated to do, whether we are motiv motivated out of fear or duty or selfishness or gratitude. And what we believe about God shapes which of those motivations will win the day in the end, which of those motivations will win our heart and in turn drive our actions. This is why I so often pose the question, what is this Bible passage calling us to believe or to do? To believe or to do, because so very often those two things come together inseparably. Truly believing the gospel, truly believing the good news of the gospel will motivate us to be careful to engage in good deeds. Like Paul says in verse 8. Paul finishes out verse 8 with this statement. He says, These things are good and profitable for men. Now, what is Paul calling us to believe in saying something like that? These things are good and profitable for men. The end of verse 8 calls us to believe that Christians are capable of doing good. You are capable of doing good. You're capable of actions that are genuinely 
good, and profitable. We discussed last week how God saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, verse 5, chapter 3, but according to his mercy. If we are seeking to save ourselves through our own good deeds, deeds done in righteousness, if we are trying to function as our own saviors, then all of our good deeds will be like filthy rags in God's sight. We cannot be good enough. They will never be clean enough. Our motivations can never be pure enough. But with Christ functioning as our Savior, guess what? Believers are now capable of doing good deeds that are genuinely good and profitable. Like Paul says here, their works can genuinely please God. Christians are also capable of doing good deeds that are eternally good and profitable. Remember Jesus. Jesus said that when you invite those into your home, invite them to dinner that you're hosting, invite them to your Thanksgiving meal, then, and they can't repay you, invite those who can't pay you back, then who repays? Jesus says God will repay you at the resurrection of the just. That's good and profitable. That's a good and profitable work, not just for the here and now, but for the forever and ever. Jesus says that if the gospel motivates you to give a cup of cold water to the least of these, then you will certainly never lose your reward. Christian, through faith in Christ, you are capable of good deeds. Washed by the blood of Christ, you are capable of good deeds that God is genuinely pleased with now. And good deeds that will be profitable, not just now, but forever. While there are genuinely genuinely profitable things for you to engage in, Paul also wants you to know that there are unprofitable things for you to avoid as well. Look at verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. Now, we are probably not very likely to run into many Judaizers today who want to trace genealogies and dispute with us about the Old Testament law. That's probably not who you're going to meet day to day. But you may very well run into people who want to use cultural narratives akin to genealogies in order to assert some sort of racial or cultural superiority, or who want to misrepresent what the Bible is really saying. We will certainly, we may, we may encounter that, but we will certainly encounter foolish controversies, won't we? We will certainly encounter foolish controversies and people who make it their business to spread strife. Paul, they're, they're your Facebook friends, some of them. Paul says, all these things are unprofitable. They're unprofitable. You can feel the apostle's heart, can't you, in him saying this. Brothers, you, you've only got so much time and energy to spend in this life. Don't waste it on unprofitable things, unprofitable controversies and conversations. Don't waste it there. Don't exchange the eternally meaningful things you can do for things that are worthless. Jesus would say, store up your treasure in heaven. It's the cure for getting caught up in unprofitable things. It's the cure against it. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart won't chase after the worthless when it is set on what is most worthy. So, if you don't already know, there are eternal things worth engaging in. And there are unprofitable things worth avoiding. Verse 9 says, avoid foolish controversies. Verse 10 says, avoid factious men. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Now in our Zoom gathering at 3.30, we can talk about what this might look like in practice. But in principle... Paul seems to acknowledge here that there are some people who are so divisive or divisive, some people who are so divisive and hostile to, the, to kingdom work 
that their stirring up strife warrants a cutting off, a severing of relationship with them. One of the reasons that we are so upfront in our church membership course about our core beliefs is in order to avoid this kind of situation uh, starting up. I, I, and I feel like God has been really kind in sparing us because I have never had to see verse 10 play out in any church that I've planted or pastored. Although I can imagine situations playing out differently in which verse 10 would have very much applied. The question might be forming in your mind right now, though. How are we to know when verse 10 is needed? How do we how are we to know when to apply it? I think verse 11 contains the answer for us. Look at verse 11. Well, again, verse 10 says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Verse 11, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. What is Titus to look for in the factious man or woman that he is to reject? Paul says, you look for someone who habitually twists or perverts the truth, verse 11. And you look for someone who often condemns themselves by their own words. So on the one hand, they may assert some true things, but they are always twisting them somehow. They may, they may do something like twist God's grace into license, or twi- on the other hand, twist God's law into prideful self-righteousness. Like the Pharisees, you can spot them because they often forcefully advocate for one thing, but then actively go and do another. They're continuously being condemned by their own words. The reason for rejecting such people rides on the the confusing hurts they inflict upon the flock, God's people, and the unnecessary distractions they create to advancing God's kingdom. But if there are people who will distract from the work of the kingdom that you should avoid, there are also people who will advance the work of the kingdom that you should aid. Look at verse 12. When I send Artemis or Atticus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. In verses 12 and 13, Paul names people who are fellow workers for the advance of Christ's kingdom. Artemis, Tychus, Zenos, and Apollos. The first two of these men are meant to be the relief team for Titus. Paul promises to send either Artemis or Tychus to relieve Titus from the work on Crete and release him to join the work elsewhere, to come join where Paul where he is. We probably won't be able to plan it like the Apostle Paul did, but we often see God do the same thing in our churches. If you did, didn't know already, there is a lot of turnover in an international church like ours. But as soon as we release people, God always seems to have a relief team ready to come in and take their places. Uh, for some reason, again and again, I always doubt that it's going to happen. I, I always doubt when we send off a key family, can anybody possibly come in and, and fill that void? I'm, I'm a perpetual doubter, but God always sends the relief team in spite of my doubts, it seems. But, but even with full confidence in God's provision, I recognize that there is a pain in sending people on, like watching Titus sell away to join Paul in Greece. I'm, I'm sure there is a pain on behalf of the churches in Crete. But ultimately, we believe this, ultimately, God is the one who moves his people around. And we can rest assured that he is growing his kingdom in the process. He is wise and he is growing the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If Artemis and Tychus in verse 12 are the relief team, then Zenos and Apollos in verse 13 are the mission team 
verse 13 says, Diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Here are two men passing through on a mission, probably to advance the kingdom somewhere else, probably not Crete. Paul charges Titus to do good by helping them, making sure they have everything they need. It's in the context of helping and meeting the needs of a mission team that Paul writes verse 14. Verse 14 says, Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so that they will not be unfruitful. You see a specific example of pressing needs in verse 13 with the call to help this two-man mission team uh, on their way, to send them on their way well-equipped. But Paul then builds a larger principle of advancing the wider work of the kingdom in verse 14. We should help men like Zenos and Apollos because Christians must learn, we must also learn, to engage in good deeds in order to meet pressing needs. We as a church should be willing to engage in sacrificial generosity that benefits the wider kingdom beyond our local church. That's one reason why we are committed as a church to church planting. We want to be a church planting church. We want to equip and commission our own Zenuses and our own Apollosis. We want to give away some of our best and most skilled members for advancing the work of the Lord elsewhere. We're praying that in 2021, we will see the beginnings of a new church plant somewhere in the south or east of Paris. As a still a relatively new church plant ourselves, we want to contribute to that effort, believing that it is a good and profitable work that God has set before us to do. It's a pressing need. Paris needs churches. We are the ones put here to help with that pressing need, even if it feels like we're sending away vital people to do it. There will be some tearful goodbyes that we will have to say as a church in the years to come. But in the Lord, all goodbyes are short-lived, aren't they? All losses for the sake of the kingdom are really everlasting gains. Paul says his own goodbye and ends our journey through Titus in verse 15. Look with me in verse 15. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Even as we sacrificially give and send, there is a real camaraderie that we enjoy in Christ. I hope you feel it in in that last verse, verse 15. All those who are with us, greet all those who are with you. A common faith produces a real fellowship and a real love that distance and time cannot erase. Grace produces a community that serves one another now and will one day renew its fellowship forever. While there are many, and there may be, many, many dissonant voices all around us all the time shouting their truth claims in our ears, None of them produce what Jesus' gospel does. Good deeds from grateful hearts, full of grace and confident in the truth. Let's be this kind of community as we continue to set in order what remains in our church and in ourselves for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that you would continue to be at work in us. Lord, we thank you for the growth we've seen as we've made this journey through the book of Titus. We thank you for the elders you've raised up from within our church, and we pray for wisdom that that they would be able to lead and pastor and shepherd the church well. Uh, But Lord, we also recognize that we still have much growing up in Christ to do. And we pray by humbly by your grace that we would see it done, that you would be at work in us for your glory and for our good that we would learn to become a a people of sacrificial generosity who participate in wider kingdom advances 
uh, sending away our best sometimes to see new churches planted in other parts of Paris and in other parts of the world. Uh, Lord, make us a, a people who are zealous for good deeds uh, because of the pressing needs. May we give lavishly as you have given lavishly to us. Lord, I thank you that you've made us a people, a family together in Paris during this time. And we pray that we might serve alongside each other for, for our good and for your renown in Paris. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, be sure to join our 3.30 Zoom gathering. I've got some special annou announcements to give, but I'm going to save them for 3.30. So be sure to join. Until then, au revoir and bonjour.